Day 959 of the Ukrainian war map, also known as the Russo-Ukrainian war. Juzzy here, and today is another update as I take a simplified and down-to-earth approach to some of the most important happenings on the ground in Ukraine. So starting off, we'll take a look at those Russian losses, as currently Russia sits on more than 664,000 military personnel losses, representing an additional 1,150 in the past day. Then as for hardware losses, 4 tanks, 11 APVs, 19 artillery, and 55 soft target vehicles. However, it saddens me to officially report that the Chinese-produced Russian-operated Desert Cross 1003 ATV buggies are speedily disappearing from the battlefield. With a very steady decline in their usage and destruction over the past four to five months, and although they are extremely cheap from a military vehicle standpoint, the ironic twist is that they're still simply too expensive for the Russian army. But enters the dawn of a new era. One that will become more and more filled with soldiers on motorbikes riding into the assault like a third world militia group. And sometimes even up to two or three on a single motorbike. Then headed straight to the map into Russia as a massive explosion and series of secondary detonations have occurred at the 67th GRAU arsenal in Kurashev of the Bryansk region, which is 120 kilometers or 75 miles from the border with Ukraine, and all happening as a result of a Ukrainian drone strike onto the military target. The facility, covering an area of approximately 3.5 square kilometers, was reportedly housing a significant amount of North Korean munitions. The explosions are ongoing and footage has surfaced showing the intensity of the incident with hundreds of secondary explosions being reported. Now this arsenal, a key Russian ammunition depot, has a long history dating back to the USSR in World War II, where it served as one of the principal ordnance depots. The facility holds up to 22,000 tons of munitions and includes both open air storage areas and older protected buildings. And we know this in part because satellite images from before this latest event indicated that some of the ammunition in this warehouse was stored in the open air. Can you believe it? which likely explains the scale of the explosions. Despite the Russian claims that drones were shot down, leading to debris causing this event once again, local reports suggest otherwise as detonations continue. So this arsenal is so close to the front lines, and the Russian army really needs that sort of close access. But they also don't need that sort of close exposure to Ukrainian attacks either. What's a country to do? And we'll certainly hear more stories of shell hunger from Russian ground forces again sometime soon. Then headed into the Ukrainian map today as the Russian forces claim to have captured Kamansky in the Zaporizhia region, but the reality was far from their triumphant narrative. The assault ended in devastating losses for the Russians, who were caught off guard by the fierce resistance of Ukraine's 3rd Special Operations Forces Regiment. In classic Russian fashion, they advanced across an open field, only to be met with a barrage of FPV strikes and various artillery attacks. Pilots from the Ukrainian side relentlessly targeted the enemy, leaving behind wounded and fallen soldiers as the Russians fled in disarray. A Ukrainian soldier from one of the units mocked the Russians' bravado, pointing out how they boasted of their heroic advance while suffering massive defeats. The strikes didn't stop there either. Drone footage captured further destruction on Russian infantry near former reservoir bases, and even targeted night vision strikes on the same group. Then headed across to the Donbass as Russian logistics are getting the same type of treatment by the AFU defenders, with these most recent examples found at the front lines of the Pokrovsk direction. And then as it indirectly relates, just south of here, it can be seen that Russia wants to perform a pincer move around Hernik as a means to encircle or force a withdrawal of Ukrainian troops to the east of the Vovcha river. Impressively, the AFU continues to hold these positions beyond the river, which has in part helped to slow down Russian advancements headed northwest to Pokrovsk itself. 
then swinging up to the Kupiansk direction for a moment, as Russian forces remain just beyond the north-south road, where they intend to reach the Oskol River as soon as they possibly can. As for right now, beyond what this map shows, with no actual new gains to speak of for the Russian forces here, it otherwise appears that Russian forces are mustering up all of their resources in an attempt to push the Ukrainian forces out of the northeastern positions they hold, likely as a means to expand their own Russian positions, in order to create a larger base for their salient, so as to push harder on the western front to reach the Oskol River with. Now, speaking hypothetically, if the Russian forces were to retain this exact protrusion or salient push into the winter, just as it is now, and even before that during the muddy season, I would seriously question their ability to hold it, because it would be far from a flattened line, in terms of being a contact point or a front line, creating some serious muddied down position vulnerabilities from which they couldn't escape. But away from the hypotheticals, we'll have to see how this situation plays out. Then taking a look around on the wider map, Ukraine's 118th Separate Territorial Brigade, the Defense Brigade, fired thermite rain down upon invader positions with a Dragon Drone, and given the regular usage of this type of quadcopter munition at this stage, it's fair to say it's considered quite a combat effective weapon at this point. Then also in the east, we're seeing a lot more drone-on-drone -drone action, as I like to call it, as high-speed Ukrainian FPVs take on predominantly the, the Russian recon drones in Ukrainian airspace. And for the rate at which these are occurring, these are no longer trivial losses for the Russian military, which is something that has now since become a particularly concerning development for Russian intel needs where they require these recon drone flights to strike more accurately on Ukrainian positions. Now, as we just saw, even really just a few days ago, Russian aerial reconnaissance needs became so dire that they started pulling out the prototype unmanned S-70 reconnaissance aerial vehicle into Ukrainian airspace. And we all know how that one ended. Plus, there's a number of reports now circulating from various sources considering that this newfound problem Russia faces is directly impacting its ability to perform its medium-range precision missile strikes into any number of Ukrainian centers. So it's a game of counteracting, as it always is with war. So in other words, Russia now has to find a way to counter Ukraine's counter on this strongly performing and relatively new AFU capability. Then also in the east, we saw a strike on a Russian 2S7 Peon, the 203mm self-propelled howitzer. The supporting truck was also destroyed. They were parked together as one, almost looking like a single unit. Then to Crimea, Feodosia, Depot Blaze, Day 3, still ongoing, as gasoline tanks at the Feodosia oil depot first caught fire, and despite efforts, the flames continue to spread. Without showing any signs of stopping today, Russian emergency services have said that the fire cannot be extinguished until the fuel tanks burn out, which could take several more days. Now another explosion, this time involving a kerosene tank, which has intensified the blaze. Images taken show at least 10 fuel tanks on fire, with further explosions occurring after the photos were taken. The Putin birthday celebrations have not yet stopped. Then headed across to some news for today. So Hungary used its veto power to block a $50 billion aid package for Ukraine. The package, part of a G7 agreement, was designed to be funded by existing profits already generated from frozen Russian assets, which works out to be about $3.5 billion per annum. And of the 50 billion, the European Union itself expected to contribute around 37 billion dollars of that amount. Hungary has forced the postponing of the decision until after the US presidential elections, citing uncertainty about future US policy towards the conflict in Ukraine. However, most analysts and pundits alike agree that Hungary's PM, one Viktor Orban, would have used another excuse to block the package had the US elections not been occurring on November 11 anyway. 
But as part of some related news, Viktor Orban was in Strasbourg of northeastern France to address the European Parliament, where during a speech, the Hungarian Prime Minister was interrupted by a protester from the opposition who threw fake money at him and accused him of betraying Hungary. The protester shouted a number of things, including, quote, For how much money did you betray the country, Mr. Prime Minister? with making some references to Russia and China, all due to Orban's perceived very close ties with Russia. So this incident underscores growing discontent with Hungary's overall foreign policies from Orban, particularly with his stance on the Ukraine conflict and alignment with other nations, who are, by the way, not inside of the EU, where the European Union is a big provider of financial assistance to Hungary. Then headed across to some Russian hardware news updates, as Russia has been seen showcasing their army's use of the D-74 122mm howitzer. This Soviet piece was produced just after World War II in the 1950s, and is the first evidence of the D-74 that I'm aware of. Oddly enough, from all of the potential submitters of the video that we see here, well, it turns out to actually be the Russian MOD posting this footage. Why would any defense ministry post footage of 70-year-old short-range howitzers in use when they could alternatively provide something more modernized? My guess is that they need to provide at least some footage, which trumps the need to showcase a modernized self-propelled howitzer, which is something, by the way, that the Russian army has in very short supply. So as a result of these latest developments for Russian hardware, the demilitarization continues. Then in some more news, Russian media reports that Discord, a communication platform popular for messaging and voice chat, has been blocked in Russia and to their military for the reasons of, well, as they state right here, violating the requirements of the law, quote unquote. While some upper-level aspects of the Russian military appeared pleased with this decision, particularly regarding reconnaissance drones where some of their operations were communicated via this messaging platform, others are not so content. Russian telegram channels have voiced concerns pointing out that the move worsens the already challenging situation for Russian forces in Ukraine who rely on Discord to operate UAVs and communicate regularly. And as a result of all of this, the situation is being mocked online, with some pointing out the irony of a former superpower depending on a social media app that has severe security flaws for its battlefield communications. And despite the ongoing war, no attempts have been made by Russia to develop a secure communication alternative. But also, other critics within the Russian military also emphasize that the banning of the app only cripples the military further and seems solely intended to soothe the insecurities of the military leadership. So it's another one of those top-down approaches. It seems to make sense for the Russian Ministry of Defense, but only aids in fracturing an already fractured communication environment for Russian forces on the ground. Then headed across to some Russian economy news and almost straight to the heart of the economy, as the Russian ruble has plummeted to an alarming low, now valued at just one US cent, despite efforts by the Russian central bank to stabilize its value through a substantial interest rate hike to 19% last month, where it's expected to also go up to and beyond 20% in the coming months. So this significant decline in the value of the ruble highlights the ongoing economic struggles faced by Russia, driven by sanctions, geopolitical tensions, and the impact of the prolonged conflict in Ukraine. The weakened currency is expected to have far-reaching effects on the country's import costs and inflation, deepening the economic woes faced by the country. Now also, despite Russia's attempt to leave no stone unturned and not devalue the ruble too much, they previously turned to enforcing strict capital controls, limiting capital outflows, and compelling major exporters to convert a substantial portion of their foreign earnings into rubles to prop up the currency as much as they possibly could. 
And while these interventions initially helped stabilize the ruble, experts warned that all of the above actions do not reflect good underlying economic fundamentals, which is quite accurate to say because no country can sustain, for example, just hiking their central bank interest rates over and over again in a long-term unsustainable fashion. As such, Russia's economic situation is a concerning one to say the least that's likely to lead to long-term challenges as the domestic economy continues to decline. Then headed across to a very different kind of Russian military mobilization blunder segment, because while Russian soldiers are dying in the trenches and drinking poorly filtered contaminated water, here's what a Russian commander has set up for his private entertainment. Protected, includes amenities, and far away from the battlefield action, as these commanders accept no accountability and are largely reported to tacitly accept or if not flat out aid in the sending of Russians to the meat grinder as a means to keep the quality of their lifestyle, as in a corrupt fashion, they also look to remove themselves as far as possible from the war. I suspect this is why, in a separate incident, a Russian soldier was forced to set his own car on fire for coming into too close a proximity to a particular clandestine zone of Russian operations. Then headed across to a quick funny to round it all off for today guys, so ever wonder why Russian oil depots burn for weeks? Well, in part, the answer is right here in this video from Russia's Rostov region, as a bunch of bumbling clowns pretended to be a fire brigade, at least they're the backup non-professionals. No wonder so many fires in Russia turn into an ongoing ordeal of a disaster. These untrained clowns, who replaced previous firefighters that went to the SMO, couldn't even put out a campfire, let alone a fuel blaze. Keep the circus up, boys. So that's it for today, guys. Thanks again for watching. Please continue to like, comment, subscribe, and the support as well. And I do hope to see all of you guys there in the next one. Cheers.